we don't need a globalist Arab spring putting radical Muslims in charge of destabilization. We need a real spring, a real revolution to westernize and have a renaissance, which they're ready for. Correct. Now you hit it on the head, Alex. And that's exactly what's happening right now. It happened very quickly. It could only happen under Trump. And also, this attack spells the end of Nancy Pelosi once and for all. The time was right, and Trump measured it very carefully, because you got to remember, Trump doesn't like war. He has said from the very beginning, war is not a very useful tool. But what he did was not to create a war. It's an announcement of a war to Ayatollah Khamenei, but basically he strategically took out two of the key men in the Iran, Iran Revolutionary Guard, and he had announced beforehand, these are terrorist organizations. Anyone and he forward, he said, I'm not warning you, I'm threatening you. Remember, there are allies who agree with what we're doing. Number one, we couldn't have done this without Russia's agreement. That's what a week ago, that's when Trump and Putin agreed on it. Number two, it's a destabilizing force, which we need had to resolve in order to shift to East Asia. We want to get out of the Middle East. He said it. In order to get out of the Middle East, we have to resolve a problem that's been the focus of an issue for about 20, 30 years, thanks to the Bush, thanks to the Trump administration, uh, to the yeah, That's Obama. what Trump always says. He's cleaning up the problems the deep state created. Exactly. That's why they hate him. He's tying up the loose ends. And if he doesn't, then we'll start getting upset. Soleimani in and of himself is a real problem for agitation in the Middle East. For the most part, he is a real problem for Ayatollah Khamenei. There has been a problem between the both of them. And what happened, in effect, is we're resolving an internal and an external problem in Iran. By taking him out, we're basically saying to Ayatollah Khamenei, now it's your turn. You want to make peace or you don't want to make peace? You don't want to make peace? We'll go inside of Iran, and we already have operatives. And it's a message to Kim Jong-un. All right, riding shotgun with us for this hour is Dr. Steve Pachenik. He's going to be back on The War Room today. I really appreciate him giving us so much of his time in the new year. He really is an interesting character. His new memoir is out. I went and downloaded it last week and read it over Christmas. And I know a lot of history, and it's just amazing how many things this guy has been involved in. But that's really how it always is, is there's certain people that are doers and people that aren't. And so people see all the stuff InfoWars has done, and it's, it's kind of ridiculous that we list it all. But we're in the game of direct action as U.S. citizens for freedom peacefully with information warfare, just you know, self-taught by the truth and history. And, and, and Dr. Pachinik's worked you know, all over the place and with different agencies and regime change and you name it. And he was involved uh, in a lot of missions that were successful. The only Camp David Accord, he ran that. He's on record they, as the psychologist that got that done, the only peace deal that ever worked. And he was also involved in missions that didn't go well. The Delta Force that he helped found in the whole first mission was Jimmy Carter and all the weird triple crosses going on there. So... I can't think of anybody better to come on, and I didn't pre-interview him. Uh, this morning, I said, hey, can you try to call and get him on? I didn't even go to stepachinic.com because I'd probably visit every few days, but I didn't even want to know. I just said, I want to get him on. I, I'll say what I think. I'll have callers, and then I love the randomness and, 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 the, and, the, and, and the realness of getting him on and then seeing through his lens what he thinks uh, is is happening. Is the sleeper cell threat real? Why do you think Trump did this? Was it the right thing to do? Well, what's going to come out of it? How are the neocons going to respond? How does this, what does this do to the back channel? We know that Obama and Hillary and uh, Kerry are still having, was, uh, have they been doing things with Iran to embarrass Trump and the, and the Pentagon? Um, so those are all my questions. And then we have all these great callers. They're going to bring up their own points on this and we'll get Steve Pachenik's take on that. But when we go to your callers, now that we got a guest on, I know you understand this, just quick question or comment, and we'll get Pachenik's take on that as well. His website is, of course, uh, stevepachenik.com. And we also have um, Owen's going to be popping in just with a few comments. We're going to have Syrian Girl uh, popping in as well. I'm going to host in to the fourth hour. Uh, so thanks for joining us. Wow, 2020 is already off uh, to a roaring, roaring start. Uh, give us your prime approximation uh, as, as a leading, I think, long-term expert on this. Well, as much as I've criticized uh, the issues of going to war, and particularly 9-11, a lot of the problems that arose as a result of the Iran hostage siege, 9-11, really has come to fruition right now. I am for the assassination of Soleimani. I would have done it a little bit more elegantly. I would have done it quietly. I would have had more evidence. The reason for this 
is far more complicated than anybody has realized in the news. Number one, for several weeks, my own people have been telling me that contrary to what the New York Times reported and the media reported, the riots in Iraq was not against the American embassy. It was against the Iranian leadership in Iraq that was totally corrupt. Now, you have to understand, I don't mean you, I mean, in general, the American public has to understand that from the very beginning in 79, when I, when I was involved, to say to Jimmy Carter personally, do not put in our uh, embassy personnel in Iran or anywhere else and let, you know, the, the events transpire without our intervention. We have had nothing but Iranian corruption underneath a Muslim leadership. Now, I say this with the ability to say, look, I've been in Iran. I was at Khomeini's house. I negotiated with Khomeini, and Khomeini clearly told me about his son Khomeini, who wasn't very bright. And in turn, what happened is that Khamenei has had a power struggle with Soleimani, who came in to power and the head of the Revolutionary Guard over 20 years ago. And in turn, we were involved in another war, which we don't talk about, which we did initiate, and actually one of our neocons, Zami Khalazad, was instrumental in that, and that was the Iraq-Iran war, which we don't talk about. And, and, and I'm not going to interrupt you in a moment, because I want you to be able to roll, because you are a leading expert on this, but you're saying my gut level visceral reaction is right thing to do, uh, let's the deep state know they're not going to play double deals with Iran against the U.S. is a message to North Korea on so many fronts. Trump made the right move. Absolutely. But more importantly, it's a message to the children and the young people in Iran that we're with them. And in fact, that we're not only with them, but we will help them to dispose of the leader, Ayatollah Khamenei. The amount of corruption that has been there has been so serious. I didn't go on the air a couple of weeks ago, but I had one of my videos where I said clearly thousands of young men and women in Iran were killed by the IRG under the order of Soleimani and directly the order of Ayatollah Khamenei. He couldn't care less. Now, the most interesting element of this is when I was in Iran 10, 15 years ago, I went to Qum. Qum is the headquarters of the Iranian Persian uh, Muslim belief. I have a great respect for the Iranians because they're Persian. And ironically, we Jews pray to Sarius and Darius the Great. I mean, Bibi doesn't tell you that. Suleimani was a Jew, but we have a lot of respect for the Persians. Ironically, in Qum, the Ayatollahs there said to me, this is not a legitimate government under Khomeini or Khamenei. And the reason for that is there was no reason to have a Muslim society in Persia, which was far more advanced than anybody had advanced. Now, what happened in effect was Soleimani began to grab power. He became more and more powerful. He was one of our allies between 206, 209, when he was in Iraq. But the reality was, and my own men had said this to me, and I had to turn my own opinion around. When we invaded Iraq, which I was against, and everybody knows that, I'm still against it. Nevertheless, we had to deal with a very big issue there. And that issue is something we didn't talk about, which was the Iranian soldiers under Soleimani had killed killed hundreds of our own brave warriors. It wasn't the Iraqis, it wasn't Al-Qaeda, it wasn't ISIS, it wasn't anybody else except the Iranians. That left a deep, deep memory in the minds and the hearts of my soldiers, my military intelligence, the CIA, and we never said very much about it. But in, the, in return, we felt, we felt that this was going to be a lingering problem for us. Now, Having said all of this, the scenario around the world was perfect for the takedown of Soleimani. What do I mean? Number one, in one of my videos, I had said in Lebanon a few months ago that the young people of Lebanon, Shiites, Sunnis, uh, all were protesting the corruption of Hezbollah. That's right. We don't need a globalist Arab spring putting radical Muslims in charge of destabilization. We need a real spring of real revolution to westernize and have a renaissance, which they're ready for. Correct. Now you hit it on the head. Alex, and that's exactly what's happening right now. It happened very quickly. It could only happen under Trump. And also, this attack 
spells the end of Nancy Pelosi once and for all. She can't say, oh, we didn't know about this. You know, we weren't briefed. Too bad. If you're too busy doing work that's not relevant to the nation state or our foreign policy, you don't belong there. None of the Democrats belong there because they really weren't involved in any Well, you know they states. leak it. They can't help themselves. It's not a question of leak. They're incompetent. She doesn't really understand what the republic is about. She has no understanding of the history. She has no understanding of how we work. She really is lazy and stupid. That's correct. But I would say even more so, it's her swan song. It's not only hers. It's also Schumer, who doesn't understand. Schiff, who doesn't understand. All of these individuals, are, are they're totally not relevant to the running of our republic. So when they talk about the deep state, they're not the deep state. The guys like me and others sure, sure. who have been running this for 30, 40 years, we're going to maintain the republic no matter who's there, and it's not going to fall apart. And listen, when One you say that, it's not an arrogant statement. The power is always the people taking their kids to school, the people working out in the fields, the doctors Correct. taking care of people, and the people Correct. communicating and saying no, and the quiet... Uh, silent majority in government corporations that also know what's going on. And so it was a message to corrupt, evil, powerful oligarchs across the world as we see the nationalist spring, the populist spring, that it's going to spread in the Middle East, Central Asia. Uh, you know, India's now got, you know, Hindu nationalists fighting radical Islam. The world's on fire. It's awakening and pushing back against these arrogant, corrupt establishments and letting so-called God Suleimani, invincible mastermind, know, no, you're like everybody else and now you're dead. You're not as special as you thought you were. And that's what my gut level instinct was. But we'll talk about it with Dr. Steve Pachinik and take your phone calls. Dr. Steve Pachinik's our guest. You can find his new book at stevepachinik.com. Great website. And remember, the system is fighting to stop everybody from having their own communication. So you support independent media. It is revolutionary. His new book, American Warrior in Crisis, is excellent. If you want to read a real memoir of real direct action and special operations, this is it. And it sounds pretty amazing to go research it because I'd already studied a lot of history and seen stuff that Pachinik was involved in and his name in it at the head of it and a lot of it. And then people hear this stuff on air and are like, that's just too much to be involved in. Well, you haven't been around in stuff 40, 50 years. That's what happens when you've done it. It's, it's, it's really true. And he's not a coward. He'll come on this show. Let me raise that. It's an article up on Infowars.com. Paul Joseph Watson, CFR president, says the world will be a battlefield after Iran escalation. And so you've been a member of the CFR. You resigned after 9-11 uh, for the fact that they were involved in it. Richard N. Haas, and uh, they are really, uh, the establishment's trying to uh, give Trump a backhanded attack. I thought they love war so much, but I guess they didn't make this call. Why, why doesn't the establishment like what just happened, Dr. Pachinik? Alex, let me tell the audience. Number one, the CFR is nothing more than a geriatric unit for has-beens in both the Republican and Democratic administration. It was set up by the Rockefellers. It's run by a bunch of people. Richard Haas is the paramount leader of such an orga organization. He has a big mouth. He's never served in our military. He's a terrible national security advisor. They don't know what they're talking about. They get funded by everybody, including the CIA and MI and anybody else. And honestly, I left it because it's useless. Not only is it useless, but they're so self-aggrandizing that these people really don't understand the nature of war. They don't understand what PSYOPs is. They don't know what agitation propaganda is. So they're not relevant. What you're seeing is that the alternative media, the Alex Jones, the Owen Schroyers, the Steve Pachenics, we're becoming the mainstream while the New York Times hits us with conspiracy theories. And I start laughing. I said, fine. You want to write in Wikipedia that we're conspiracy theorists? Fine. I don't particularly care. I happen to know what the truth is. You happen to know what the truth is. The CFR is so antiquated. It's for self-aggrandizing individuals. You've got the Hillarys. You've got the Clintons. You've got the Bushes. It's it's nonsensical. I left it not only because of 9-11. I left it because it's a pathetic organization. And Richard Haas is the paramount, pathetic Jew who talks a lot but never served our country. And I can go through that whole list of the other leaders involved. Well, I was about to say, you mentioned MI6, British intelligence, helping set it up. Nothing against the British people themselves, but the CFR is a globalist, anti-American organization. And I've watched their meetings. They just congratulate each other 
and just spew this crap about China's going to dominate America and America sucks. I mean, what a bunch of jerks to hate their country so much. Well, it's not only that. There, there you've got Joe Biden. What more pathetic? Who went and committed, he admitted to crimes at the CFR and Haas clapped. And all these other little, little, little wimps. Look at this guy. These are know. legends in their own minds. That's my point, but the point is you don't imagine need to that guy in a, Imagine that guy in a fist fight. You want to go to war with that guy? You think that you guy's going to lead America? I think that guy cares about you folks? Alex, that's, they're the Mickey Mouse of the world. You don't, you don't even have to engage with them. They're so irrelevant, you have no idea. No, I agree. I, I, I agree, though. And, 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 and now, so I'm, 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 I want to go to some but calls, you, but why do you think there's... Why is this, in summation, why is this good, what Trump did? It spurs revolution against the Islamic State, uh, against the it's Iranian not, Islamic State. Not, why is it good? It's, it's an amazing action because it basically puts Ayatollah Khamenei into a position where he has nowhere to go. And internally, he knows that we're going to start agitprop and we're going to take him down. This is a signal to Iran that we're finally going to take you down, not necessarily with strategic motion, uh, movements in armaments, but we show them how effective we can be on a one-off or using our own intelligence. And it's also a signal to Ayatollah Khamenei, we've pervaded their entire society. When we need to, we will create the agitprop to bring down Khamenei. He's counting his last days, in effect. And this let's expand on that. He thought because of his back channels to Obama and others that Trump would already be gone by now. He shot his mouth off saying, you can do nothing. You can't do anything to Trump. Now he looks like a complete fool to the whole world. Well, he is a fool. I mean, even his own father, I told you, I went to his house and I negotiated with his father, who was very bright. I don't agree with him, but he said, my own son is not very bright and you're going to have to deal with him. And the truth is he wasn't very bright. So he had to depend on a Soleimani who came out of the Iran-Iraq war and he was ruthless. In turn, what's happening is the corruption that came into the system, including the Iran Revolutionary Guard, was so offensive to the young people. And these young people in Iran, they're exceedingly bright. I got to tell you, I went to the University of Tehran. These are incredibly bright students who speak English. They appreciate America. They do not like the mullah. They do not like to be repressed by an antiquated religion, which hasn't been, you know, modernized in hundreds of years. And in turn, what will happen is Trump has said, you know what, Obama, you know what, John Kerry, you failed. The CIA failed on the Brennan. And what I'm doing is to eliminate the $180 billion you gave in hostage fees to the Iran uh, leaders. And that I'm now making sure that we wiped out that debt. And that was and another now, question I was going to get to. Uh, you, you've said fire a bunch of people at the National Security Council that have worked for Obama and the Bushes and the Clintons. Uh, Trump's now doing that. Uh, and, I, yes. and the word is he's going to fire even, uh, even more. That's correct. But thanks to you, I was able to announce it and on a video to say, look, Mr. President, you can't have... 100 people on the phone. You've got to have at most maybe four, five, or 10. Under Baker, James Baker, we had a very tight ship. And either by the way, Doc, you're not just saying these messages get to Trump. We're not just saying that to act powerful. That's why they have congressional hearings yeah. saying we can't let InfoWars in the White House. we got to keep Trump from it because he hears this common sense. We were the ones that exposed Fiona Hill being a, a Soros operative and McMaster. They literally want me dead just because of that, which again shows how powerful is the deep state that a radio show out of Texas saying to the president, hey, this person's a globalist, hurts them. It shows why can't Trump, though, get more people around him to, to help him navigate? Because I get he's a businessman and knows how to get those things done, but he's got to get those traitors out. Well, Unfortunately, he bred his own self-destruction on a show that I said to you years ago when he brought in the neocons. When you bring in John Bolton, who is a chicken hawk, I've known John, I've, I, he and I have talked and we've worked together, but honestly, he is nothing more than a war hawk. But when you say, go to Vietnam, come on, John, you wanted the war. He said, oh, no, 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 I don't want to get killed in the uh, trenches. Why don't you come to war in Iraq? Oh, no, I don't want to get killed. So what you have is the entrance of a lot of these chicken hawks under John Bolton who came in and said, we're going to go to war. Well, the time was right, and 
Trump measured it very carefully because you got to remember, Trump doesn't like war. He has said from the very beginning, war is not a very useful tool. But what he did was not to create a war. It's an announcement of a war to Ayatollah Khamenei, but basically he strategically took out two of the key men in the Iran, Iran Revolutionary Guard, and he had announced beforehand these are terrorist organization. Anyone and forward, he, he said, I'm not warning you, I'm threatening you. Phone calls with Dr. Steve Pachinik, I promise callers, bam, 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 when we come back, stevepachinik.com, I'm Alex Jones with Infowars.com. We'll be right back. All right, we got to move quick here. We got a bunch of loaded phones. I appreciate everybody holding. I got to a lot of calls in the first and second hour, uh, but we haven't gotten to any right now. Dr. Steve Pachinik's riding shotgun with us. I'll go back to Tarif, who held over. Carlos, uh, Peter, Baldy, Lou, Josh, Justin, Chris, I'm going to go in the order that your calls have come in. And uh, who would be the longest holding here? I guess that would be Justin in Virginia. You're on the air with a comment or question. Go ahead, sir. Yes, Alec. Um, I'm a 31-year-old farmer in Virginia, and my community has really been hit hard in my lifetime. My population has been replaced with brown people that speak a different language to me. Countless friends and family have died from heroin overdoses. The family farms are going away. Um, and we believe in Trump because he was supposed to be America first. And I believe in you. And I feel like crying right now because I have stickers, your Infowars stickers on my truck. I buy your products. But you really let me down with this whole situation. And I, you, you sound like a fool going in circles trying to cover for Israel and trying to make sense of all of this when you know it's not right. And I love you, Alex, but this isn't right, and you need to get on your hands and knees and repent to your audience and apologize. This, this is nuts, and you know it's nuts. Well, I Justin, well, Justin, let me respond, okay? Uh, I'm fighting the fentanyl coming into the country, and, and so is Trump. Um, and Iran has a dictatorship that just mowed down 600 of their own people. Uh, communist China is a dictatorship with 2 million Muslims in concentration camps. Hold on, hold on. Who, who cares? I, I, I'm not a globalist. I, a globalism is for this world government. I'm for America, but America still has interest in and I don't want these wars. And I've given you my honest view uh, on what Trump did. Uh, and I've had play what Tucker Carlson had to say, and I get his perspective. And we've had callers that agree and disagree. We're not a cult where we're one thing or we're the other. We're trying to have a discussion. Okay, so so quantify why I need to get down on my knees. I want to get Dr. Steve Pachinik's take on this because what I've done, uh, my issue is I know Iran's running proxy armies all over. I know they're working with elements of the deep state to try to sabotage Trump's plan to get us out of the Middle East. And and and, and this would actually lead to Iran being run to their own, by their own people. Will the neocons and others try to go into Iran and set up some new horrible thing if, 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 if the Ayatollahs fall? Absolutely. Do I want regime change? No. I'm talking about real politics, the real stuff going on in the world. Do you think I'm like a hawk pushing war here? Absolutely. You entertained... Um uh, regime, regime change and like a uh, you sound like Obama with the, the, a new Hold on, how do you I'm think how do you think Trump got North Korea to come to the table? The deep state through China had them threatening to attack Japan and everybody to to try to get us into a war and make us look like idiots. And then Trump geared up and they backed down. L let's get Steve Pachinik's take. Uh, Doc, you want to comment on what he's saying here? Well, with all due respect, I came out of the same area this gentleman comes from, Virginia. If he has a problem, I understand Virginia is a, a disaster of a state now. I do what I did. I moved to the south. I moved to Florida, to Texas. The Northeast, Virginia, Maryland, New York, California, Illinois, Michigan will all be finished for simple reasons. You have governors who are totally ineffectual. At the local level, you're totally ineffectual. You don't have commissioners who can do roads or do anything else. You can complain, sir, but the bottom line is very simple. You come down to the South, you come down to where we have no taxes and we carry guns, I think you'll be a happier man. But don't blame Alex Jones. This is not his fault. This is it's not anybody's fault. Let me throw this that in this way. Let me throw, but, but I mean, I think it, he's allowed to ask a question. I agree with you. Let me throw this at him and get both your takes on this. I got really mad when Trump bombed that little chemical base in Syria because I thought it meant a huge war like it always has in the past. He did that to silence the hawks and to then make the enemies back off. And it was a measured response and it worked really well. 
Okay, now if this gets expansive, I'm not going to be happy. I think this is a measured response. I don't like seeing the troops being upped. It could go bad, but but I don't understand how you, how, how, how you think I'm betraying you being pro-war. I'm not telling Trump what to do, and I think we'll still see how this unfolds. Wait, with Steve, because Steve, I'm staying in Virginia because my family's been here since the 1700s. I'm fighting. I'm either fighting or that's all there is to it. But we, this isn't America first. We got to get out of all this stuff. It is enough, Alex, and you know it is. And well, I think what Pachinik's saying is, is, is if that regime goes down, and they get a populist regime in Tehran. That will absolutely stabilize a lot of the Middle East, and, and you won't have the big Shiite-Sunni conflict, and Saudi Arabia won't have the excuse to be on the warpath. Is that an accurate statement in your view, Dr. Pachenik? Yeah. Also, remember, there are allies who agree with what we're doing. Number one, we couldn't have done this without Russia's agreement. That's what a week ago, that's when Trump and Putin agreed on it. Number two, it's a destabilizing force, which we need how to resolve in order to shift to East Asia. We want to get out of the Middle East. He said it. In order to get out of the Middle East, we have to resolve a problem that's been the focus of an issue for about 20, 30 years, thanks to the Bush, thanks to the Trump administration, uh, to the yeah, That's Obama what Trump always says. He's cleaning up the problems the deep state created. Exactly. It's why they hate him. He's tying up the loose ends. And if he doesn't, then we'll start getting upset. I mean, I mean, Justin, I think you got to give us a little bit, you know, I mean, a little bit more benefit of the doubt here. In the room. Let's just stop with this, with the stuff. It's oh, okay, Israel. Justin, I appreciate your I, call. I, I got to move on to other people, all right? All right, I got to move on to other people. It's very interesting calls, and that's how you're able to call in. CNN and stuff, when they take calls, it's all controlled. You just called in, you're on the air. That's what InfoWars is, not a cult. Um, Tharif, we had him on earlier, but I want to hold him over to ask you a question. Tarif thinks it might have been a false flag by another country like Saudi Arabia or Israel with the attack on the oil workers to get us into this. Uh, what do you think, Dr. Pachenik? Well, the attack on the oil workers was, I think, uh, it may have well been a false flag, but this had nothing to do with what was going on with Soleimani. Soleimani in and of himself is a real problem for agitation in the Middle East. For the most part, he is a real problem for Ayatollah Khamenei. There has been a problem between the both of them. And what happened in effect is we're resolving an internal and an external problem in Iran. By taking him out, we're basically saying to Ayatollah Khamenei, now it's your turn. You want to make peace or you don't want to make peace? You don't want to make peace? We'll go inside of Iran, and we already have operatives. And it's a message to Kim Jong-un. I'm sorry? And it's a message to North Korea. The North Koreans, look, Kim Jong-un is not a stupid guy. As I said, he went to school in Switzerland. I went to school in Switzerland. I stayed there for a week. I was kicked out. He stayed there for three years. So he has a clear understanding. What the problem is, is what he saw under the Clinton, Obama, and Bush administrations, that when you say you're an ally like Gaddafi, we then take him out. Then when we say to Saddam Hussein, you know, take away your weapons, then we take him out. So Kim Jong-un is saying, listen, guys, I want to be friendly. I'm not interested in a war. But the minute you take away my weapons, you take me down. So the answer is Trump has to convince him. We're not going to take you down. We'll take your weapons away. And guess what, Kim Jong-un? I want to build hotels just where and you're Kim building. Kim Jong-un's been waiting to see if Trump can really stay in power. It's not only that. He likes Trump. He knows he'll stay in power, but he wants to see what in turn he can get for concessions that he knows he needs to make. And, and that's going to be the piece that the last caller really wanted. All right, we're going to go to break and come back and take a lot of calls. We're going to go to Chris. We're going to go to Tony. We're going to go to Josh, Lou, Baldy, everybody. Oh, and Troyer, you're going to have this gone with you for a couple hours later in your show. Briefly, what's your take on this situation? Well, there's so much to get to. It's tough for 50 seconds left in this segment, but I will just say this, um, you know, just looking at the what we know for sure and kind of the, the responses we've seen geopolitically, it may be fair to make a comparison to what we saw in Syria where, yeah, we didn't like the airstrikes. We feared further intervention, further war, but now look what's happening in Syria. Russia's taking over there. Their forces are going in. U.S. forces are retreating. So it's, it's a slow trend uh, that sometimes seems like maybe we, we push back when we need to be coming out, but maybe that's what you need to clear some space to get out. So, so we'll see. I agree with the caller. We need to get out, but it's going to be messy. And look, the guy was responsible for killing hundreds of U.S. troops, and the Democrats are denouncing his murder. I mean, how bad does that look for the Democrat Party on top of everything else? No, that's right. And, and Trump's making deals with Turkey, too. 
We're going to take a lot of your phone calls right now with Dr. Steve Pachinik. He'll be back on to give some deep analysis with Owen Schroyer on the war room today. 3 to 6 p.m. What, Dr. Pachinik's on at 4 o'clock with you? Yeah, 4 o'clock. We're going to have an hour with Dr. Steve Pachinik. Glad to have him on the war room today with his expert analysis. We'll also be taking calls as well. All right, I want to speak of the devil, get to the calls, but I just want to say this, going back to the caller before last, I think his name was Justin from Virginia. I really study the way the world works, and I really study how governments work and all the rest of it. And Trump's legitimately trying to have economic power and, and work with countries and not have this destabilization strategy of tension globalist plan. He's very pragmatic. And there's this word people just salivate and get sycophantic when they talk about Israel and, and go, oh, you're, you're for this war, you're for Israel. I want out of the Middle East. We've got to deal with China if you want to talk about a real threat. And Trump's trying to pivot there, as Pachinik just said, that's a fact. And then people just say, oh, you're doing it for Israel. Oh, wait, oh, Israel's giving me orders right now. That's ridiculous. Hunter Pachinik's a huge critic uh, of Israel, if anybody knows that. That, that. That's just asinine. He's tried to run projects to round up all the Israeli spies. So, it, but people call in though, and it's just like magic. Oh, you're 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 against the Iranian regime because because they hate Israel. Some people hate Israel so much they love the Iranian mullahs. That is just crazy, Doctor Pachenik. Well, let, let me put it this way: Israel created a myth about Judaism, about the Holocaust. That you know, I've talked about it before. The American Jew really doesn't understand what the Holocaust is. He makes up numbers of six million, but the fact is, Bibi has grew up in America. Israel has its own problems. We're not there to help Israel. Israel is going to have to deal with Hezbollah now. And it, they did not do well in 2000. I have rounded up Mossad operatives and I put them in prison. I've also warned Mossad that they could not get involved in 9-11. Afterwards, I put them in prison. And by the way, I you really did do that. People think you're just, but, but, but let's go back. You really lost family to Hitler. It's on record that you, you know, came to the- yeah, uh, I lost my family, but the point was this. This. I mean, Hitler's one thing, but the one thing nobody talks about is before Hitler came to power, my mother came out of Russia, said, what about the Soviet Union and Stalin? He killed 7 million Christians before Hitler even came to power. No, I totally agree. What you're saying is that you've, you've exposed the professors and the books that are out there that there was actually a large group of, a large group of Jews that wouldn't let Jews get out of Germany and Poland and made them pay to the other Jews. Well, that's, I mean, look, it's very simple. Who created the uh, the uh, IBM tickets that knew we were Christians and all? Tom Watson. Who gave Mengele the projects for eugenics? That was a Carnegie Endowment, the Rockefeller Brothers. Who created concentration camps? It was the British, 1898. Unless you learn your history, as exactly. you said, Alex, you're going to be a fool, and you will just repeat the nonsense of Israel. Israel didn't take in any Holocaust Jews. They didn't want it. When uh, Ben-Gurion was asked by Eichmann, who spoke Hebrew, he said, do you want three to 400,000 of these people in the camps? He said, no, I'd rather have pigs. And ironically, guess who was the leader of taking away the Jews? A man by the name of Heydrich, an Austrian Jew. So within Hitler's army, there were over 146,000 Jews. Two out of the five field commanders, I'm getting tired of this, were Jews. That was the big secret that, 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 that Hitler was really a Rothschild, and I've looked into it. It's true. I didn't make this up. I mean, the whole thing about Israel is a cockamamie story that they we need a land of the Jews. No, in 1965, America pulled out, so they came up with the story of the Holocaust. But, but, but here's my deal. I'm not even against Israel. All I'm trying to say is these ignoramuses call in and, and, and like, magically go, oh, you're you're doing this for Israel, when they don't even know what they're talking about yeah, or who they're talking to. I mean, I, it's ridiculous. I, I feel like that's just kind of a different approach to sitting go, here it's saying... It's like saying you're a Russian agent or, or, oh, you work for the Jews or you work for the Vatican. No. I work for freedom, damn it. I have integrity, and I'm sick of that crap. It's just another thing like, oh, they're all wars for oil or they're all wars for regime change. There's a lot of different factors that go into these wars in the Middle East. It's a very complex issue, but but it, it the problem is, and, Alex, and, and, it gets And half the damn oil goes through there, and the Iranians and, and the... And the and the Saudis are about to kill each but, other. But, We're going to have World War Three. Let's look at the issue at hand now. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Man, you have people concerned now that Iran is going to strike the United States. But again, it's my understanding... If you're making comparisons here, this was a drone strike targeted on one individual. It looks like it just blew up a car. No weddings got hit. No civilization, uh, you know, centers got hit. 
Uh, it wasn't a place where residents and the guys and they killed literally around. run these bulldozers where they haul women and children up by their necks well, the, and kill them if they don't wear hijabs. The, the guy's a damn Defense, butcher. He's dead now. The Department of Defense released documents claiming this guy was responsible for over 500 U.S. troops' deaths and being maimed over there as well. So again, but how about this, Alex? Again, let's just look at what we know and what's developing. So now you have all these Democrats and leftists saying, oh, we're afraid Iran's going to strike. Well, you know, we've got a wide open border right now, okay? And we're going to sit here and bitch about what's going on in the Middle East, and you're going to have wide open southern border, and you're concerned about Iran attacking us? Well, let's, con let's, let's do something about no, the border. No, I totally agree. We have to do something about that. Uh, let's take, take a call from Chris in Washington. Thanks, Chris, for holding. You're on the air with Dr. Steve Pachinik and Owen Schroyer. Yeah, hey, thanks. Thanks uh, for having me on. Uh, Dr. Pajenik, Alex, Owen, I appreciate all, all that you do appreciate and you. all the wisdom that you guys have together. You're all together. I don't Thank have you. anything knowledgeable that other than I agree with everything you're saying. I mean, you, you guys have been hitting it right on the spot. Well, I appreciate your call, Chris. Let me ask Dr. Pajenik this. Sleeper cells, how big a threat is that with the uh, Kuds and, the, and their the militias and embedded groups? And how are the neocons and globalists going to try to spin this and, and towards their aims? For one, we, there aren't that many sleeper cells. We're not worried about it. Number one, you got to look at how big we are as a nation. We, we're huge. We're four time zones larger than most countries. In terms of the neocons, this is what they started with 9-11. This is what they started in the Iran-Iraq war. You got to go back to the 1980s. For the gentleman in Virginia, he's got to understand this goes back to the 1980s when we initiated wars against Iraq and Iran. And guess who flew for Iran? The Israelis. In the 1980s, for eight years, the Israelis flew on behalf of the Irans without marked airplanes. In turn, we flew for Iraq. So what happened as a result of that war, and Soleimani came out of that war as a major, major uh, uh, soldier, and he, it was like World War I. One million people died in Iraq, one million people died in Iran. I was there. I saw the massacre of it. It was worse than World War I. It had nothing to do with Israel, other than the fact we asked Israel and the Iranian Humani to, to fly on behalf of the Iranians. This was a war started under the Bush administration, the Reagan administration. We sent, Schultz had sent tear gas to that area. I was there when they sent it. So if you want to go back to you mean history. mustard gas? Think, mustard gas, that's correct. We sent mustard gas. Now you know, and, you're, and your fans know it. Do you think anybody in the news has talked about that? No. Do you think anybody in the news goes back to the Carter administration or the Reagan administration or the Bush administration, all of which I was in and I was against, but nevertheless, I served my country. So it's very easy for somebody in Virginia to say, oh, I'm disappointed in this and that. It's much harder to be what you have to be, a citizen soldier. You don't like what happens, try to make it better. You work at the local level. You don't like what happens at the local level, then work at the national level. But stop complaining. Americans have to stop complaining and understand. You don't like what's happening? Then organize. If you want to be a Democrat, fine. You want to be an independent, fine. You want to be another party, fine. But don't tell me about your miseries. We have a huge country where we're doing exceedingly well. Well, I think I don't want to get derailed by that caller. My whole point is we're all legitimately having a massive discussion and debate about was this right? And I think we're saying we give Trump the benefit of the doubt, and we see the strategy, and we hope it doesn't go terribly bad, uh, but we're doing it as Americans who have that right, and we're all on the same team. Well, we need to respect the elements here, Alex, too. I mean, if you play a game of football when it's a clear day out versus when it's uh, snowy and windy, you're going to play a different game, and, and that's what we're dealing with here. The Obama administration had different elements. The Bush administration had different elements. The Trump administration has different elements. So we're dealing with an entirely different set of elements here. And I and believe it's not Trump is, is America first, and he's proving it. And so we give him the benefit of the doubt. And it's not easy to sit here like if you look at the carryovers on the foreign policy from the Bush administration, from the Clinton administration, from the Obama administration, from the Bush administration, it's kind of the same elements. So it's easier to come on in response to something Obama or Bush did. It's usually moving the same agenda. It's a different set of elements now. We're still kind of looking at the field, analyzing how everything's ending up laying on this whole geopolitical chessboard, and, and maybe things will look clear in 2048 Beautifully said. Hours. I want to do five more minutes with Dr. Pachinik, the Syrian girl, 
who lives in Australia, but whose family was in the you know, ruling party at the top uh, uh, in uh, Syria, really smart. She's against what happened. We're going to get her perspective. That'll make some folks mad as well. But final segment with Dr. Steve Pachinik will be back on at 4 to give a deeper analysis uh, with Owen Schroyer on The War Room. That's 3 to 6 p.m. Band.video on the satellites uh, for radio and TV. Only way people find out about it is you, the awesome listeners, taking the action. There's no radio or TV like this anywhere else, and it's all thanks to your support. The big year-end sales end on Monday. Biggest sales ever. Take advantage of them before they end at FullWarsStore.com. All right, I want to go to Carlos, who really wants to talk to Pachinik and, and a bunch of others, and I'll continue into the hour with your calls. Syrian girls popping in. Owen's going to have Pachinik back on today, hopefully for a couple hours he can do it. Uh, but, but I was asking you, when, when Remington said, you supply the pitchers, I'll supply the war, uh, when, when, when Hearst said that to Remington, I, I know what war propaganda is. I know when it's a major push coming out of the government. And I know Trump's not in full control of the government yet. Cause, but when they do these pushes on me with the fake Sandy Hook news, uh, you know, that have lost lawsuits and stuff, usually it's not even true, on every channel on New Year's Eve while the balls are dropping, who the hell is giving that order and, and, in, in your view and what is that? Let me put it this way so that the American public understands. The deep, deep state that we're talking about is not what it, about Clinton or any of that. We have a phenomenon called the Mockingbird phenomenon that was done in the 1950s. What happened was the CIA, as it grew up, came out of the OSS, made a deal with Graham of the Post, with Paley of uh, newspapers, with all the Washington Post, the New York Times, CBS, Paley of CBS. We all agreed in that time in the 50s and later on in the 60s that much of the news that will come out has to be integrated with our intelligence and our propaganda machinery. So when Alex Jones, who comes out of the mainstream or becomes a paradigm shift, eventually becomes encompassed within that discussion. And what do I mean? Most people don't understand the deep, deep state, it's nothing about Hillary or anybody else, is really a constant Hegelian dialectic, to make it very simple. We go both Democrat and Republican. We create tensions on both sides to maintain the viability of the Republic and the vitality. So when you think the New York Times is hitting Alex Jones, you better think again who is really hitting Alex Jones. And if you think Alex Jones is just simply attacking the New York Times, then you better ask, why does a guy like Pichenik come on? And why is he asked repeatedly, will you come on? So the point I'm trying to say to the American public is you're part of an ongoing revolution that's, in, uh, that's part of the narrative of the republic. The narrative that's the president. But the average leftists really legitimately hate me and don't even get uh, that, that they're being invoked to attack by smarter folks that understand out of the clash and the process, it'll help reignite Americana. I'm not saying I'm not organic and totally legitimate. I'm my real self. You're just saying the archetype is being used in a dialectic conflict. Correct. Now, and you got to understand, it, it, I, you're, I'm, we're pitting, let's, we're, I'm putting a Nancy Pelosi against Alex Jones on any spectrum that makes no sense. A woman who's literally on a swan song with a man who's constantly been in the forefront of news every day and, by the way, happens to know his history and happens to know the difference between a republic and a democracy and a Nancy Pelosi who has to go to our own people to find out that we're not a democracy and then comes back with absurd notions. That kind of dialectic is part of this Republic. And once again, the Republic is not a democracy. We have representatives. So it's just like the founders created separation of powers at every level. It's a real okay. conflict, but, but, but it's being set up so that people can make their own decision and see how pathetic the globalists are. And this is a process. That's exactly correct. But you have to remember, and this is what the Democrats do not understand and the liberals. Hamilton, Madison, all of our great Jefferson hated the tyranny of the masses. They came, they saw the revolution in France and what happened to King Six, uh, Louis XVI, and they said, we will not have that in our own revolution. That's why they did not accept the tyranny of democracy. And that's exactly what Pelosi and the Democrats have no idea about what they And so before about. Hegel ever codified it, the founders had already put in a Hegelian dialectic into the country itself, which is the secret to the republic. 
You are brilliant. You hit it right on the head. You see, you should have been a professor at MIT. No, no, I... no. Hey, Doc, you're awesome. W please come back soon. You will on the show with Owen. Steepachain.com. Yeah. People can find your new book there. Thank you. Grow a beard, Alex. Do I have to grow a beard? No. I don't have any. No. I, I, uh, the, 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 the no, Alex Luther is going to shave good. his head, actually. <laughs> I'm thinking about shaving okay. mine, but not now that he did it. Hey, hey, thank you, doctor. <laughs> All right, hey, we, I got, I'm going to jam these calls in, Owen. Syrian girl's coming up. Thank you so much, Owen. You're going to be on with in an hour. Yes, that's right. War Room. All right. Stay with us. February 27th, 2019 is on record and is recognized not just as the biggest long form podcast in 2019, but the biggest ever. It was my second appearance on the Joe Rogan podcast. The third largest podcast he's ever done was my first appearance two and a half years ago. Now, why is that important? Well, it shows that what we're talking about and these issues of shadow government and the international blackmail rings and hidden technologies and breakaway civilizations and the post-human world that's being built is very, very popular. People are looking for the truth and that is a very, very positive thing. Now, that said, look at how overweight I am in the video from the podcast. I have lost 39 pounds since then. In fact, a month later, I was in D.C. bullhorning the White House, asking Trump to take action on internet censorship. I'd even gained more weight then. It was only about three and a half months ago that I made the decision to take all of the InfoWars life supplements that I've been promoting to the general public. That's right. I was working out the same amount, same lifestyle, everything, working very hard under a lot of stress. And I had forgotten to take most of the supplements because I get busy and I stopped taking them like everybody else does. And when I religiously began to take almost all of the supplements, some of them I don't need like the joint formula or things, and it's been incredible. The X2, the X3, the vitamin mineral fusion, the fish oil, the krill oil, the brain force plus, we've been getting more reports out of it, more focused, and everyone can see it. And then when I've got to do an overnight radio show or something, boom, half a packet of Turbo Force. These products are the very best supplements out there you're going to find, and they fund our operation. And so as Christmas 2019 comes and goes, give yourself the gift of these products and funding the info war. And into the new year, commit to take the X2, the X3. Commit to take the BioTrue Selenium. Uh, commit to get the gut fusion that is incredible what it does for your overall health. These products are amazing. Get the Super Silver fluoride-free toothpaste or the Super Blue fluoride-free toothpaste with tea tree oil and so much more. It makes your life better. It funds our operation. It will defeat the globalist if you continue to support us. So it's a total 360 win. Whatever you do though, take action. It's made my life so much better. It's made my mind so much clearer. You'll find all the great products at InfoWarsLife.com. Now it's easier than ever to have Band.Video on your iPhone. Simply go to Band.Video with your Safari browser. Then you click the share button at the bottom of the screen. When the menu comes up, you simply click add to home screen. It will then ask you to name the app. I suggest Band.Video. You will now have Band.Video app on your home screen, despite the fact that Tim Cook tried to stop it. The globalists think you're lazy, but by taking a little bit of action, you can override them, have the app, and then tell others about it so they can get the app. So it's up to you whether you want to defy big tech and click the share buttons below on your email, on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, however you want, be sure and share Band.Video.